So this week, the New York Times reported on the rise of a disturbing new genre of domestic abuse. In the past year, support workers, lawyers and survivors have started describing strange, almost paranormal happenings that take place when victims are home alone. Air conditioners and lights switch on and off without warning. Speaker systems will suddenly blast out music. Pin codes for digital door locks change daily without notice. There is a strange sense that you are being watched and monitored all the time. Of course, it will already be clear to many of you what is happening. The smart home technologies, which are now present in some 30 million homes in America, purchased on the promise of an ever-widening gyre of ease and convenience for users, are now being turned, with the aid of linked smartphone apps, into tools of intimidation, violence and surveillance, predominantly against women. Researchers say that men in heterosexual couples tend to be the ones that choose to install these gadgets, and according to the women interviewed in the Times article, men retain disproportionate control over these technologies and, by extension, over their partners. So what does this bleak vignette suggest about the times we're living in, times that James Bridle calls in his excellent, unflinching new book, A New Dark Age? It vividly illustrates, I think, the dangers of ignoring James's central message, that if we persist in thinking that technology is either politically neutral or positively emancipatory, that it is nothing more than a slave to our needs and desires for a brighter, ever sleeker and more computable future, then it risks instead enslaving us to the technology itself and to one another's darker urges. Our vision is increasingly universal, James writes, but our agency is ever more reduced. So just how can that be? James is a multidisciplinary artist and writer, and his humble, intriguing and urgent book, I think, is a clarion, clarion call for a better politics. Not a clearer politics, mind you, but a cloudier one, a diagnosis of the present that shows how it might be possible to act with integrity, despite the fact that the challenges now are so complex that they simply won't render themselves up to human understanding. Instead of fleeing into a utopian future of computed, transparent perfection, James invites us as the feminist theorist Donna Haraway might put it, to stay with the trouble, to embrace with courage and responsibility the potential that's nested within the now in all its mess and ugliness and unknowability. Ranging across the secret life of drones, what nuclear fusion reveals about the prospects of human-machine interaction, the history of computing, the creepiness of kids' shows on YouTube, the archaeological treasures of the Siberian permafrost and the political propaganda of ancient Egypt, James's book is packed full of revelations and frank... frank, frank packed full of revelations and frankly fascinating factoids, too many Fs in that sentence, <laughs> that might just suffice to startle you out of despair and into action. At least that's what it did for me. So James, welcome and thank you so much for writing this book and for being here. So we're going to chat for about 45 minutes and then we'll take some questions and then James will sign books at the back. So as you can hear, I'm Australian, but since we're in Britain, we should of course start by talking about the weather and this book is shot through with meteorology, and you make the claim that all computation begins with attempts to predict and control the weather and so predict and control the future. I found that quite a startling claim. Could you elaborate on it? Yeah, sure. Uh, so first of all, thank you very much uh, for having me, Virtual Futures. Thank you all very much for, for being here on a very warm, lovely evening in a dark basement, uh, which is weirdly, obviously appropriate, but still very nice of you. Uh, and, and, and thanks for this, it's great. Um, so yeah, the weather, um, it, it all comes from the weather. Um, I mean, you can pick any one of your origin stories you like. I think for a lot of the stories I'm telling and a lot of the stories I'm trying to tell about computation and its history. Um, but I like this one about the weather because it really, one of the key things it does is super emphasize uh, the human origins of computation. And in fact, how computation started as something that, that was done by humans. The first computers were called humans. And the guy who I talk about a bit in the early part of the book, a guy called Lewis Fry Richardson, who was the first person to work out a mathematical model for predicting the weather by basically turning as much of the world as possible into data, doing some kind of transformation on it to say, well, okay, this is what will happen over the next X number of hours or days um, in order to essentially predict the future. Um, and he did this, but he did it mostly as a kind of um, intellectual exercise because he didn't believe at the time that it would really be possible for people to do the maths um, uh, as fast enough to actually stay ahead of the weather itself. Uh, he actually spent um, his first calculation of one day's weather forecasting 
uh, which he undertook in 1916, uh, actually took him about three and a half months uh, to predict 24 hours ahead of where he started from. Um, he also was doing it while an ambulance driver in the First World War. Uh, so he was also like taking cover from shells while doing this with pencils and paper. So it was not like ideal circumstances for computation. Um, but he really didn't believe at this point that like humans could could actually do the thing that he, he, he thought was mathematically possible. Uh, and it took another kind of uh, 40 years before computers were capable of, of going faster than the weather itself. And the person who, who did that, uh, who made that possible, who kind of created that um, situation was John von Neumann, who's uh, kind of one of the greatest computer scientists of all time, was also central to uh, the Manhattan Project. Um, which was the development of the atomic bomb in the Second World War. And actually, so, yeah, quite a lot in this, I talk about these two places. Like, this is basically what computers were invented for, was to uh, predict um, and therefore be able to control, to some extent, the future, uh, and also to completely and utterly destroy it through atomic uh, weapons. How did that shift take place? I was very struck by this kind of transition from trying to predict whether it's going to rain tomorrow to all of a sudden doing calculations for thermonuclear bombs. And these seem to be the two axes of analysis that your history of computation plays between. Why, how did that transition happen? Uh, well, I mean, primarily because the thing that finally kicked computation into gear, that finally made us start to build real computers, uh, was, was wartime. Um, suddenly, huge amounts of people have been thinking about doing this for kind of 20, 30 years. I mean, for much longer. Babbage was developing all the mechanical bits of this in the kind of mid-19th century. Um, but, you know, various things had to come together and, and the, the main thing that came together was, was wartime funding uh, to make, uh, to first to provide firing tables to be able to calculate like where shells and stuff would land and then subsequently to, uh, to design the atomic explosions. Um, but the real, the, the thing that I find completely fascinating that happens in that process and I talk about a bit is that um, this, you, you, because, I think particularly because computation was developed under these conditions of wartime secrecy, it's developed as something secret, essentially. So you have this kind of incredible effort to design and build computers, and, and the, the, to really, in, in the space of kind of six or seven years, go from having almost nothing to having things that we would totally recognize as computers today, uh, despite they were kind of the size of a couple of rooms back there. But still, like, we, we got there in kind of seven, eight years, the whole foundations of the whole thing. Um, but it was done with this real idea of secrecy involved in it. And that was never like, the intention of the people who put it together, but it seems to have kind of left within computers themselves a kind of desire to shut themselves off. And in the book, I trace um, uh, the way in which they looked particularly and how they were perceived by people and how by seeing the various early computers you can see how, um, how they kind of disappear. So there's, there's, there was a very famous one called the um, IBM SSEC, which was a computer the IBM built, one of the kind of very, very first big computers built in 1950. And they were so proud of it that they installed it in a shop front uh, in New York City uh, on Fifth Avenue uh, in a building that's actually now part of uh, LVMH, the big luxury brand's good, and it used to be a shoe store. Uh, and they put huge plate glass windows in so everyone could see this huge computer which like filled the whole room. Um, uh, and they had people typing on keyboards and putting data into this whole system. And people would come along and like press their noses up against the glass of this shop. Um, um, but what the computer was actually doing was, was top secret calculations uh, for the detonation of the first hydrogen bomb. Uh, the, 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 the maths they needed to do for the first hydrogen bomb, which was an entirely secret process, was done in, behind plate glass on Fifth Avenue in full view of the entire population of New York. But because of the nature of competition, it was impossible for anyone to actually see that that's what's happening in that space. Um, and so, yeah, that, that's, that's what I come back to, I think, repeatedly in the book, is this insane separation between kind of immense power and immense legibility of the world, if you know how to use the machine or what the machine is doing, but the ability to actually completely hide that at the same time. I particularly loved your description of the computer that came before IBM's computer, which I think it's called the, the ENIAC, isn't it? And you say, the equipment was arranged into 42 panels, each about two feet across and three feet deep and stacked 10 feet high. It consumed 140 kilowatts of power and pumped out so much heat that special ceiling fans had to be installed. To reprogram it, it was necessary to turn 10 pole rotary switches by hand, the operators moving between the stacks of equipment, connecting cables and checking hundreds of thousands of hand soldered joints. And what I love about that is the way you describe that, even though of course it it sort of looked insane, provided that you had a, sort, a certain grammar of the space. You could, un, you could see the computations unfolding. But then in the shift towards this IBM machine, 
in one way it was opened up to the public because everyone could see it, but in another way it was rendered sort of beyond our grasp. It was turned into the kind of computational equivalent of the iPhone where you yeah. can't even kind of get inside it. And so it's this combination of transparency as a tool for concealment that you seem to come back to. In yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, uh, there's, there's kind of two things about the internet that I love, one of which is that if you didn't know what it's doing, it was covered in like little blinking lights, properly looked like something out of kind of old, old uh, sci-fi movies. Uh, and so if you knew what it was doing, you could literally kind of watch mathematics kind of running around the room and like read what this computer was actually doing, um, if you understood it. But uh, And the people who worked on it had that really kind of intense personal feeling. There was a mathematician called Harry Reid who worked on the ENIAC, uh, who in his memoirs, he writes about like, uh, he says the ENIAC, even though it was like the size of a couple of large rooms, um, actually felt like a personal computer. Um, now we think of a personal computer as like this little thing you carry around, but but for Reed, it was a personal computer because you lived inside it. It was like the size of size of a house. It was architecture, um, and for me that that quote's always been super poignant because in fact, like it didn't shrink. It got way 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 bigger. Um, the computers that started then they actually they actually carried on expanding, and that computer that that Harry Reed and a few other people lived inside in the 1950s is now a computer that we all live inside because that computation has stretched itself entirely around the planet through fiber optic cables and distributed computing this thing that we call the cloud and even all the way up into space like we're all living inside a, a huge computational system now um, but we yeah we, we very rarely see it or think of it like that. I'm reminded of um, a statement by the uh, media communications scholar John Durham Peters where he says um, it's hard to say whether the nitrogen cycle or the internet is more vital to the survival of the planet now and there's this this kind of awareness that up until the 19th century the term media could also refer to things like water, fire, anything that sort of allows for movement or action and I think one of the things that you do in a really fascinating way in this book is you sort of perform that. You're trying to put the realm of the ethereal and the digital into conversation with the very material, the very physical, the kind of um, mundane data centres in Slough that house international stock exchanges. And, you know, the history of computing, when it's told at all, seems to be told in as though it's a history of ideas, but you're very attentive to wanting to ground it in the material. Why do you think that's important? Um, well, the thing you said about nitrogen cycle is kind of interesting, it made me think, because um, like, I think it's important because like, we see these metaphors in, in the shape of the machines. Um, what I mean is, like, I actually went on like, this weird tour of a forest quite recently and someone explained the nitrogen cycle to me and it's completely amazing. The trees are all talking to each other. Um, it's, it's an incredibly networked system with this kind of information passing in the form of nitrogen through root systems. But she explained it in the form of something computational. She, she used all these terms from, from cybernetics. She talked about data. She talked about information flowing. She talked about networks. Um, and uh, so it's, it was just this brilliant example for me of the way in which um, actually when you, when you create a kind of a metaphorical language around technology and know how to use it, you can use it to describe other things kind of incredibly well. And so while I'm really, really down on many aspects of technology, mostly the societal and cultural aspects. Um, I use this language all the time and I find it an incredibly powerful language. Um, and actually learning a little bit about it gives us all access to this incredibly descriptive language of the world. Um, it's not the only way of talking about the world, but for me, like having some sense of these, you know, bogglingly vast systems, essentially. Having some words to start talking about them uh, gives us a certain amount of power over them. And the, the machines themselves are trying to sort of show us these words, right? By telling these different stories about them, you start to be able to sketch out these infrastructures that you can then apply to thinking about other things, whether it's the nitrogen cycle or, or the internet itself. But there is a worry there, isn't there? Because one of the things I read your book to be doing was kind of saying how when you start thinking computationally, there's a fear that that which, that, that which uh, can't be computed also doesn't matter. And so if we can't compute something, somehow we're paralysed in the face of it. So there's this notion of the metaphors we live by, they're not just describing the world, but they're kind of also shaping it because they shape the, our potentials for action. Um, and I think this comes back to the central paradox of the book that how is it that when technology seems to be rendering ever more vast areas of experience within our control, how is it that we seem to have societies that are spiralling very far out of our control? Yeah, I mean, the, the, well, the, the meteorology thing again. So one of the metaphors I talk about quite a lot in the book and, and reuse over and over again is this thing of the cloud um, as this, this 
cloudy thing that has sort of crept into everyone's awareness in the last kind of decade or so, or, or however long it's been, that the cloud has assumed such central importance in 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 um, kind of our, our daily lives, but as a thing that is is rep presented almost as an absence, right? It's something that we don't think about all the time. Everyone knows that all their devices are doing stuff with the cloud. Um, uh, but like the whole point of that is that you don't have to worry about it. You don't have to think about it. That's, all, that's always what the cloud has signified is this like magical far away place. Even engineers talk of the cloud like this. You draw diagrams with like a picture of a computer here and a line goes here and it just becomes a cloud because that's over there and you don't need to worry about it. Um, and so it's a convenient place to put all those things you don't need to think about. Uh, or at least that was a good idea in the 1950s when, you know, that was that really was someone else's problems. But uh, like huge amounts of important things happen in the cloud now. Um, uh, you know, we, we, we do most of our financial transactions there. We do most of our social uh, lives there. Our social relationships take place within the cloud and are increasingly kind of owned by it. Um, uh, we, we vote there, we, we borrow, buy books, or borrow them from libraries. All of these functions, banking, all of these functions that used to be kind of present in the public sphere now take place in this kind of numinous other place. Um, and so a lot of the work in the book is, as you said, like with the stock exchanges, um, like bringing those back down to earth, being able to point at this thing and say, hey, if you want to talk about the cloud, and if you want to talk about in particular about the politics of this cloud and who has power within it, uh, it helps to be able to point at it. Because like we have, I would think, like fairly simple animal brains that really, really struggle to um, like think about a thing that you can't hold in your hands or touch, which is our general problem of talking about computers. And um, you, oh, God, no, no. Sorry. Oh, oh, I was going to say, but your prescription in the face of that problem is not to say, let's clear, let, let's try and make things as concrete as possible necessarily. I mean, I, I, maybe I'm misreading you, but I, I saw you to be defending the cloud as a way of thinking. And like you defend darkness... Um, as something that we have to accept and as there being a certain potential in darkness instead of the sort of discourse that, current, that typically circulates, which is greater, greater clarity, greater transparency, greater illumination of all of our problems is somehow going to help us. Can you talk about um, cloudiness and uncertainty and darkness as sources of progress? Yeah, um, well, I mean, this, it, it comes out of that thinking of wanting to kind of bring the cloud back down to earth and point at it and, and doing that for a long time and gradually coming to the position that it is actually insufficient. It's always going to be insufficient. Like we're never going to have this kind of totalizing knowledge of everything. And it came out of also thinking about this grand paradox that's at kind of the heart of the book. Like I'm, a, I'm an internet hippie kid, right? Like I grew up with the internet on it. I love it. It made me who I am. And I sort of believe in it on what's, you know, occasionally gets close to a kind of faith-based level, right? I have that much care and, and love for this thing that I'm obsessed with um, and that seems to be everywhere and in everything. Um, and yet, you know, the central promise of it was always that uh, more information kind of makes everything better, um, which has taken me a long time to realize is just the, the kind of encoding, literally the encoding, like the writing down in forms of law, of actionable kind of lines of code, the enlightenment ideal that like you provide more and more information, we, we, we create more knowledge about the world and everything improves. And um, I, I think about that a lot and then I look at the world, <laughs> uh, which is, it seems to be inc increasingly uh, characterized by misunderstandings, by failures to comprehend, particularly by opposing fundamentalisms by people who seem to believe radically different things, uh, despite the, the most incredible availability of information at a, at a level never previously available to our species. Um, something, is, something is wrong there, right? Something is fundamentally out of whack in this, in this idea. Um, and, 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 and this idea that I have hewed to for a long time, which is that you could, if you just keep pointing at the damn thing, right, it'll, that'll help. Um, uh, that, that actually maybe is not, is not the, the, the best approach, um, or at least not the final approach. And so that, that's where this, this focus on cloudiness and, and darkness comes from, um, because, it, because it actually says it is insufficient to know everything. Uh, that's that's not going to work and it's not going to help us. So we have to be able to operate in a landscape where we do not, don't understand everything, where we cannot understand everything, where we have to actually admit the possibility of doubts about certain things and yet still be able to act, still be able to act um, kind of with, with, with full agency, with our own power, uh, with justice, with ethics. 
um, to make decisions that will actually shape the world without, um, yeah, falling into this trap of feeling like if only I knew a bit more about this thing or understood this thing better, um, because that's essentially how we're kept from power, by being told that we don't know enough. And actually, um, in, in most cases, we, we do know enough. Uh, and we can make we can make certainly ethical and, and moral judgments without having to be the person who understands all of this stuff all the way down. One of the things I hear you to be saying in talking about the limitations of the Enlightenment project, the limitations of knowledge as a source of empowerment, is also a statement about the limitations of reason as a tool of persuasion. Now, of course, you're an artist as well as a writer, and could you talk a little bit more about, about how you switch between these modes and sort of what function your art plays in terms of helping you answer certain questions as opposed to your writing? Um, I think they're just different ways of thinking about stuff. I mean, what, what, what the book is largely about is me just like literally trying to figure this stuff out for myself. And if other people, this so so so, so hideously self-deprecating, but I really mean it. It's like, if it, if it helps you to think through these things as well, that's really good. But literally what I'm doing is kind of laying this stuff out because this is what I'm thinking about. And uh, maybe by writing it all down, it will help. And we might talk about that, about why it takes some of the forms it does, because that is genuinely my intention. Other times the intention is different, or I don't really know what the intention is. Um, so to take a couple of examples from the visual art stuff, I mean, the project where I, so in the book, this thing we've alluded to a couple of times, I took a bike ride from over two days, uh, first from Slough into London, then from London out to Basildon. And that was actually weirdly a commission for the Hayward Gallery, which they didn't really get, which is fair enough, because it, it was all a bit weird. Uh, but what I was doing was I was tracing the uh, line of microwave dishes that run between the London Stock Exchange in Basildon and the New York Stock Exchange's facility, uh, sorry, Slough and then to Basildon, um, as a way of, as I said, like drawing this line along the cloud thing to see it. Um, and I didn't know what I was going to find until I went out and did that thing. Like, I didn't really know, as, as, as with most of these things, why I was particularly doing that thing. Uh, but, we, you know, as many, many other artists have done in the past, going for a good walk usually, you know, kind of figures this stuff out. And this insane moment happened where I was um, passing through Hillingdon, which is out by Heathrow, and uh, found one of these microwave points, which sits atop Hillingdon Hospital, um, uh, which is uh, you know, a really an absolute sort of monument of the NHS, one of Bevan's founding hospitals, as he has a ward named after Bevan. Um, and of course, is in the state of most of the NHS today, um, uh, you know, chronically underfunded and struggling. Uh, and on top of it, there's these two microwave dishes uh, through which are flowing billions and billions of pounds every day, uh, privately traded that nobody else can see. Uh, that literally, like, is literally invisible. Yet, by because you're sort of tracing this physical infrastructure, you can actually see this thing occurring up there. And I realized that that was what I, I'd kind of gone out to look for metaphors, right? And in here, when you actually have the financial services literally as kind of parasites uh, in, in kind of steel and, and um, uh, microwave dishes at, atop like a concrete NHS hospital, you can, lit you can see kind of exactly what's going on. Um, and so each of these these things, whether it's it's kind of the visual art practices or or the book, it's a way of kind of yeah understanding what I'm trying to say. Um, I mean, the other one that's not in the book, but is is like last year I tried to build my own self-driving car. Um, uh, which, How did that work out for you? Uh, it, well, I wouldn't trust my life to it. Uh, to be fair, uh, but then I'm not a very good driver myself, and it was learning from me, uh, which basically <laughs> meant like covering this car with cameras and feeding them into a machine learning system and blah, 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 in order to understand how all of these bits work. Um, but I didn't really under, you know, I was just doing it to kind of try and understand what happens. And I actually, but the weird thing happened, which is that because I live in Greece and just wanted to go and test this car in a place that's kind of unlike where a lot of this other technology is being developed. You know, it means something different to try and build a self-driving car in um, in Greece today than to do it in, you know, Silicon Valley or in a kind of test track outside Munich. Um, the, the environment matters in this thing. So I, I drove it out of Athens and started driving up into the mountains and I ended up driving it up, up Mount Parnassus um, because I'm in Greece. Uh, and But in Greek mythology, Mount Parnassus is the home of the muses. It's the home of arts and sciences and knowledge in this sense. And I suddenly realized that I'd kind of, I tried to build this technological hack to conquer like art and science itself, right? That, that all of this kind of mythology and, and history collapsed into humans trying to like hand over this duty and duty of thought to these automated systems. Um, all of which is to say like the, the, this, this questioning can be done in various kind of modes and forms, um, but it's mostly done by doing it.
There is a really interesting attention to kind of mythology and myth-making in your book. I'm reminded of where you tell the story of Prometheus, which is well-known, stealing fire for humanity, but also Epimetheus, his brother, who kind of forgot to give us humans a defining quality, um, having done the rest for the animal kingdom and, and various other parts of the world. And so Prometheus was kind of left in a position of having to steal fire, fire for us to, as a sort of consolation prize. And um, you say, you make, have this very nice phrase where you say, this puts humanity in a position in which it must constantly struggle to exceed its own abilities in order to survive. And so we're kind of constantly caught between, on the one hand, being um, being vulnerable to the world, and on the other hand, constantly trying to sort of transcend our condition. I wondered if you could talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, I mean, well, I, th I think the thing for me is that is also that, like, the the story of Prometheus and Epimetheus is one that's been told kind of throughout history along these kind of various different lines. And and actually, what what it, it, you know, it's been taken up by. I mean, I, I mostly take that particular telling for Alexander Galloway, who's a great writer on on kind of um, technology and cyberculture. Um, uh, but the point is that these stories are there to be kind of picked up and reshaped. Um, and so when we're talking about like you know humans trying to exceed their ability or trying to work out what is this system that we can kind of build on next, um, like the stories that we tell around that thing shape it deeply. Um, and at the moment, like very few people are telling these stories, right? The, the histories of computation I tell in the kind of earlier chapters are stories that have only been told by um, kind of a few historians of computer science, basically. This is starting to change in really nice ways. There's another book out that just came out called uh, by Claire Evans called Broadband, which is a history of women in um, in the in the history of the internet and the history of computation, the role of women engineers and other people in that. So there's starting to be this kind of outside interest in this history of science that has completely shaped the world. We're familiar with a lot of kind of the hero stories of various bits of like 20th century, 19th century enlightenment science, but the, 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 this, these histories of, of computation uh, of the internet, of these technologies that have completely shaped the contemporary world, um, sort of haven't really been well told or particularly have not been well mythologized, right? Because the, the job of the storytelling bit is to pick these up and remake these stories in new ways to tell us new things about the thing that we didn't know before. Um, you can tell this story any number of ways, um, but like what you choose to do or what you choose to emphasize in that story supremely matters. And this, this thing I've, you know, as well about, um, being able to operate in darkness and uncertainty is also partly me covering my ass, right? <laughs> like, because I'm not a historian <laughs> and I'm also a terrible programmer and a number of other things. I'm an amateur in all of these things, but I, I, I see that as being completely essential to this process that like anyone can pick up these stories and make of them what they will and kind of understand them in their own way. I, I, if, I'm, if I can shift gears a little bit, um, coming back to these questions of, um, of social justice, I suppose. I, you make a declaration at one point in the book that the start of the Anthropocene shouldn't be dated to the invention of the coal-fired steam engine nor even to nuclear power, uh, but further back to uh, colonisation and genocide caused by the European invasion of the Americas. Why do you say that? Uh, because it's true. Uh, or at least I feel it is. Yeah, that's a particularly dark section of the book you picked there. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, um, because it's, it's to me completely extraordinary uh, and it's an example of... Um, um, again, how we can choose which of these stories that we want to tell about the world. I think I think that's why I did it. I'm not necessarily sure I thought too much about why I chose that particular example before, but I, but I think this is why that it's another example of, of being able to do this. Um, like if we're to, so much of the book is about taking technology at face value, of saying, hey, well, if we can really do it with this thing, why are we doing this with it and not this? Right. Um, so when we're talking about um, the Anthropocene. For which I'm sure you're familiar with, but this this question, which which is incredibly kind of narcissistic of us to like pinpoint the exact moment when like we became visible to the planet is I think possibly one way of describing it. Like at what point we enter the kind of immutable record of the planet, and people say, well, it's well, you know, when we blow up atomic bombs, because then there's suddenly um, no radiation everywhere that wouldn't be there, or it's. Um, um, it's when we started mining coal and kind of uh, changed the surface of the planet. And in one part of the book, I talk about the fact um, that actually uh, we're deep visible. Like one of the, one of the times we human activity first occurs on the planet is is um, is around the Columbian extinction, uh, when um, uh, 
the Colombian disaster, whatever you want to call it, when when the when you know the old world took the new world and everybody died, uh, and low and the huge huge communities collapsed. Uh, Africa was also people with millions and millions of people were taken from Africa and transported. The result of that was that nature actually regrew. It was a really good time for nature because there were fewer people for a while, and the uh, the rise and uh, sorry the drop in CO two that uh, that happened because of that because suddenly there were more trees and everything else is visible in the ice cores in the Arctic. Right, so we, we, can, we can drill down into the Arctic, pull up these ice cores, these amazing repositories of knowledge, and see this exact band of when uh, the New World went to the Old World and, and exterminated everyone to violence and disease, uh, preserved there in the historical record. And, and, and it's sensible through science. Um, and so you can then take that and you can use that to make arguments about the present and our responsibility in the present. If you have this kind of knowledge and this ability to read the world. And so it's an argument that many others have made that like, um, you can use the language of science and technology to make um, to make ethical arguments, to make, to make political arguments, um, and that it's yeah. It, it, if if we're like a big part of acknowledging that technology is not politically neutral, i.e., people can use it to do like bad things with it, essentially, uh, but it's also to make the argument you can do good things with it. That we can we can take this understanding and spread it more widely and use it to make other kinds of arguments as well. Do you? This is quite a big question, but. Do you think there is a causal relationship between computational thinking and various forms of social and economic oppression from patriarchy to racism? Yes. Um, so um, I would maybe, ex well, no, it's probably not causal because the timeline's wrong, but let me explain. Let me, well, uh, so computational thinking. Uh, which I sort of explain in this other book is was the term that I came up for for basically what happens when we think of the world as something to be computed, right? When you regard the world um, as uh, as essentially something made out of data that you can read and act upon, and and specifically by doing that, you can build a model of the world that replicates the world and behaves like the world and make your decisions based on that model of the world rather than on the world itself. And this is a thing that seems to be happening a lot at the moment is that we, we all we all we all do this we all carry around a model of the world in our heads um uh and and and, and act surprised when the world doesn't always like meet our our mental model of it we've all had that experience that kind of cognitive dissonance um what's happened or one of the things that feels like it's happened is we've kind of externalized that model right we've, we've built a huge vast planet system planet spanning system to to replicate that model this this particular model being like uh, information as knowledge data as a way of thinking about the world we've instantiated that across the entire planet and then are constantly surprised uh when weird shit happens that doesn't fit with this kind of magical enlightenment model that we've built um so um what the, what that does is it encodes all these kind of bad things so no i don't think it would be reasonable to claim that computational thinking in like has created uh patriarchal racism to take two examples because they've been around with us for a very 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 long time um what it absolutely does do is instantiate them in a number of ways right it actually builds them into so i tell you know all these hilarious stories in the book around uh uh you know how like you've all heard the stories the the the, the sony camera that's uh you know won't take a photo of someone's blinking and therefore refuse to take pictures of chinese people because it thought they were always blinking um or the the um the system in the us which they built to um like advise on sentencing in courts and turned out to be um like structurally biased against black people and like it was basically based <laughs> because if you take if you build an expert system uh which is based on um in the case of the court cases, like they were, they were trying to like encode the justice system. Uh, what well, they did, but the justice system is massively racist, right? So the system they built to help judges continued to be massively racist as well, because um, it was based on on a, an entirely racial history, um, racialized history. Um, uh, so yeah, so one of the things that happens with computational thinking is that again, you mistake the world as something neutral. You think, oh, we can compute all this stuff, uh, but actually the the you know, one of the big problems with that is this kind of problem of just kind of filthy, dirty data, which is which is history, right? Which is which is Benjamin's account of history as like always been written by the victors, always completely styled, always a product of complete oppression. And if we want to go like go around building uh, computer systems based on that history, we're going to end up in a very very bad place indeed. Um, the the flip side, because no, try, um, uh, is that uh, is that it makes that really really clear, right? Because people can pretend they're not racist, but it's harder for computers to pretend they're not racist. Um, uh, 
and 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 that's that's again we keep cycling back to this but that's this knife aid knife edge that i find so fascinating about technology how it can kind of occlude and hide uh so much stuff but like you only have to crack it open a little bit to make some things radically legible that were just completely invisible to us before. You, you make this interesting argument that conspiracy theories are a way of kind of certain forms of knowledge erupting into the public space. Um, you, you, you tell the story, I think, on one of your expeditions uh, to make art of meeting a cab driver who you engage in a conversation about chemtrails and you kind of say, I mean, you've got this sort of grudging respect for conspiracy theories. You, you sort of talk about them as though they're weapons of the weak. They're ways of people people know deep down that, yes, there is a conspiracy against them. It's just that the conspiracy they then recount is not the right one. Could you elaborate a bit on conspiracy theories? Yeah, I mean, it's just it's endlessly fascinating, not least because it's the kind of, it is also the, the folk literature of the internet. Like conspiracy theory, again, conspiracy has been around forever, but like the internet is clearly where they have they've become the dominant cultural form, right? And have then become the dominant cultural form of our politics today across, across everything, right? Conspiracy theory is, is our current kind of highest, not high, like most dominant mode of expression. Um, and, um, yeah, I'm fascinated by it because, because the people who, so the, the, one of the things, the ways I talk about conspiracy theory in the book is following Frederick Jameson, who basically talks about conspiracy theories are like a poor cognitive mapping of reality. And I have issues with his use of the term poor. But basically what he's arguing is that conspiracy theory is a result of the world being incredibly complex and trying to write simple stories about it. And I, I, I do completely agree with that, with that reasoning, right? The world is too complicated for simple stories. Most people want simple stories, like our brains work them, so they kind of reduce, reduce, reduce. And so you end up with these kind of completely absurd things, but are ways of trying to understand the world. And the reason I'm definitely interested in that is because I really respect attempts to make sense of the world. Right? Like, I, I think it's, that's a good part, to some extent, it's a good part of our brain, right? Because it's really, it's overmatching. It's, it's finding these insane patterns in things, which is a thing the brain is very good at doing. Um, but, but I, but I want it to be there because it's, it's what, we, it's how we tell stories. It's how we connect things. It's how, it's how we think about stuff. Um, and the thing is, it turns out to be right in interesting ways. And, um, so yeah, I talk about the chemtrails thing where, where, um, uh, I'm out looking for spy planes, which are totally real. Uh, and this guy's looking for chemtrails, which is just rubbish, right? But we're, we're both looking at the same planes in the same sky. We're both seeing the same thing. We're both looking up, which very, not a lot of people, not enough people do, right? We keep, we're both like really keeping an eye on stuff and we're just seeing totally different things, which is really extraordinary. Um, and at the end of the book, I, as well, I, I talk about this weird conference I went to a few years ago where I got invited by accident to Google's secret conference, which they have in a hotel called The Grange in um, in Watford, which is the same hotel where two weeks later they have the Bilderberg conference, right? They're not even trying, right? <laughs> <laughs> like, Bilderberg is, well, if you don't know, is like the, the Ur conspiracy of um, basically where all the powerful people in the world meet up every two years and burn a giant owl and decide the fate of the world. Um, the thing is, it's true. I mean, that is what they do. The Builder Girl Group is a big collection of really powerful people. They include all the prime ministers and financial ministers, and they do go to the weird hotels around the world and burn an owl, uh, because that's what rich and powerful people do. Like, it's, it's not a conspiracy theory, it's just the way the world works. So it's this, this like, these, these are, when I'm writing a whole book about trying to like, reframe how you see the world, like, it's good to take on these things and say, hey, like, you know, some of these frames are useful. Some of them are interesting. And while you have to be incredibly careful here, because, like, there's a lot of really nasty, dangerous people using them for really horrible, horrific ends, right? Again, conspiracy theories are not a neutral tool. You can do really, really terrible things with them. But, like, also weird things happen. Like, the, the example I talk in, in the book is, like, it's, it's a, a, you know, emblematic of a different way of seeing the world, which, which is necessary. Um, and where partly that discussion ends up is talking about the um, various uh, groups of, of uh, First Nations people in Northern Canada who've been talking for years about how the world is is off kilter. Uh, they they actually they they started to write and talk about the fact that they believe that the Earth has moved on its axis because the sun is setting in a different place to where it used to historically. And they've been saying this for years, and everyone scientists are just like, "No, you're crazy. The Earth's axis is exactly where it was." Um, 
But it's increasingly obvious that what they're actually talking about is, is that the, the, the atmosphere is different. Uh, that the chemical composition of the atmosphere is so different because of industrialization that the sun and uh, and the way it reflects through the particularly the different air at high, high latitudes appears differently to how it used to appear to their to their parents and their grandparents and their ancestors and the way they describe it and the way they talk about this is not, doesn't fit within these scientific ways of knowing but they're talking about a thing that that is absolutely happening and is it absolutely real and that they're actually the people at the kind of forefront not just of seeing but also kind of being affected by as well um, so yeah, it's it's a plea to like take these these alternative ways of knowing these alternative framings of stories really 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 seriously. I mean, I, I'm reminded of some of the research that's been done, for example, on this kind of uh, repeated conspiracy theory in the U.S. that um, Kentucky Fried Chicken is owned by the KKK and that there are well, I mean, this didn't is even a, know the, that one. This yeah, whole, no, whole, whole various... Google evening ahead of me. <laughs> well, but, and very that that actually. Um, there is chemicals put in chicken that renders uh, black men in the US infertile. Um, and this kind of pops up again and again in various forms. And actually it's interesting because there is, of course, a conspiracy against black men in the US that is to do with prison and incarceration. Um, but instead that gets transposed into this realm of something that's sort of at least more just digestible than the fact that the whole of society is stacked against you, which is almost too terrible to be able to comprehend. Um, I feel like in the last five minutes we should try and shift the conversation into a cheerier register. Uh, if that's possible. And and one of the interesting points in the book um, is when you talk about left accelerationism. And so I think there's this interesting move in recent years where the notion of accelerationism of sort of being able to fully embrace technology, merge with machines, that's often been co-opted politically by the right. But there's been a kind of... Um, investigation of what could glibly be, be called fully automated luxury communism, but you are very, very sceptical of the potential of that political agenda. Can you say why? Um, I mean, yeah, um, but because, because I just don't see it happening. I, like, I believe it entirely um, uh, theoretically in its possibilities and what it should be capable of doing. I, my scepticism is that I, don't, I just simply don't see it happening. Um, that that seems to be kind of missing and that to get there requires such kind of root and branch um, approach to our entire kind of ways of thinking about technology. Because because the, if you talk about using technology politically, then the politics has to come first. Um, I, it, like, I don't think you can't do it by kind of ruling that automation will take over because that's that's how you get a kind of right wing politics creeping over this thing because it becomes a kind of top down position. Um, it has to come from a, a more kind of equal and democratic footing from the ground up. Um, uh, if, if that's your outcome, I mean, like I, I fully believe in, you know, um, the power of the open source movement as a way of like getting more people involved in technology and thinking about it. And I think it's super important that we take those kind of approaches. And I think if we're going to get to a future in which we're all served by robots rather than all being left on the junk heap while the robots work for the rich people, which is the future we're getting at the moment, um, uh, then those kind of approaches are important. Um, at the same time, I, I think, you know, inevitably what we'll have is, is somewhere in the middle. Like one of the best renderings I've read recently of this is Cory Doctorow's recent novel, Walk Away, um, you know, which walks this really beautiful path. So Cory's written a number of novels in over the years about like these possible futures where we've all got 3D printers and we can just go into the house and like magical, you know, new furniture and clothes will come out of these things. Or, you know, we all use weird crypto currencies to do everything. Um, and, and they were always written, a lot of them were written as these kind of future utopias. Um, walk away is kind of different because it actually, it posits this thing as a struggle, right? It's like, we're, 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 both, we're all going to have these tools, like the rich are going to have all of these robots and robot factories and pieces of automation, and uh, they're not going to like us having them either, and they're going to try and stop us having them. And, and, and so the, this future is not we all live in this wonderful happy place, and it's probably not that we all get exterminated, but it's probably that we exist in this kind of state of struggle. Um, and if you want to take part in that state of struggle, then you need to be um, kind of engaged in thinking about these, these things now. Um, so the, le the, the left accelerationism I, I see is not, is not us all sitting back while the robots take over. It, it's, it's all of us getting um, um, uh, more, yeah, greater awareness and greater, greater possibility of thought around these subjects. I mean, it seems like what you're pushing against is this notion that technology has its own inherent determinism or teleology baked into it. At the end of the day, you're trying to say it's all about us messy humans and deciding what we want to do yeah, to a certain extent. Um, 
I was going to ask, hmm. No, I tell you what, maybe at this point I will throw the floor open to you. Um, so I can't really see people. Yeah. Um, so just uh, raise your hand. I don't know if we have a microphone to pass around. We possibly do, maybe. Um, raise your hand and I'll point you out. And please make sure that whatever you say ends in a question mark. Yes, we have someone in the middle here. So a friend of mine who works in newspapers says that if um, they knew then what they knew know now, they'd have never gone online and they'd have been anti-internet from day one. Is that something that uh, you ever feel, James? Um, well, I had this, this very horrible, weird, strange experience, again, that's kind of recounted in the book last year, uh, which initially wasn't supposed to be in the book. I was procrastinating and spending too much time on YouTube um, and not writing the book uh, and discovered all these really fucked up children's videos, um, uh, which are really, really, really strange. There's a whole, again, a whole section of, of YouTube filled with kind of weird, strange, algorithmically generated violent videos aimed at children. And it's pretty, it's pretty messed up. And it led to somewhat of a crisis of faith, I would call it, in, in the internet itself, um, that I really felt as someone who'd, um, you know, yeah, grown up on the internet. Uh, and also as, uh, you know, one of the first people, I mean, like generationally of that age, uh, you know, kids who had a computer in their bedroom without any kind of supervision at all, there was parents who'd never heard of the internet, um, was lucky enough to have that access and definitely encountered plenty of stuff on the internet that a kind of 12 year old child should definitely shouldn't be encountering. And yet was kind of fun. Uh, and, uh, and it definitely made me into who I was, right? That I'm very, I hated this idea that, that, you know, this stuff that I was discovering online now would lead to that opportunity being kind of shut down. Um, um, and, and so, yeah, like I, in, in, the case of finding stuff like that, I absolutely struggle with this, but I, I, I think I managed to stay fairly clear in, in the book that none of this is an argument against technology itself, right? that it absolutely can't be, that there would be a ridiculous thing to argue a, a, against or about. Like, um, I think you uh, say at one point to argue against technology is to argue against ourselves. Yeah. Thank you. Um, that, that is exa exactly the deal. Like this, this, this exists. This is an extension of our thinking in the world. Like we, 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 we can, no more do that than stop thinking, um, uh, which we, we, we is really what we should not do. Um, like, but so, uh, yeah, the, 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 but what remains is the possibility to rethink what these things do, to ask, like, to ask, you know, what, what do we actually want these tools to do? Remember that they're tools, right? Remember that this thing was, uh, that, that has been developed and that we can continue to participate in its, in its development. Um, but also, also to remember that no one's done that yet. Uh, in the, 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 the thing I always, I always call the book an unconsciously the internet, an unconsciously generated tool for unconscious generation, which is that nobody who designed it knew what they were doing, right? It was like loads of people working on lots of different stuff, all kind of piled in together and with no central plan. And no one still knows what you're actually supposed to do with this thing, right? Uh, it turns out it's quite good for selling things. Um, and it's quite good for finding your old school friends and it's good for like sharing photos and with bits of text on them and these kind of things, right? But it remains in this state of kind of completely insane possibility. It is, it is absolutely the, the, the most extraordinary thing we've developed since language itself. Like on almost a kind of different plane to like writing and the encoding of that. Like it's a way of thinking primarily. Um, and so, yeah, like to, to keep that in mind. So no, absolutely no retreat. Um, but, you know, sees the means of, of communication and all that um, as part of that. So many people are afraid of that word technical. I'm not technical. I worked for a software company leading a team of developers for a year before I admitted I was technical. How do we break that down? How do we get people curious? Yeah, I'm fascinated by this question. I'm also really fascinated where it comes from, like, um, like where this kind of split emerged in society. Um, and actually I always, I always think of it coming from the VCR, not the computer. Um, cause the VCR was like the first programmable object in the home, uh, that actually most people encountered before they encountered a, a computer. And like, 
like something very weird happened at that moment that like most people just were like it's witchcraft i hate it i'm not getting involved <laughs> uh like you know and there'd be if you're lucky one kid in the family obviously it was me in my case who would like actually do all that and everyone else would be like nothing to do with this thing um right and it's like a, a profound like anti-intellectualism i think on one level um I, I think there is that there's something there's a kind of there's a thing there but but beyond that it was is, was mostly fear right I, I think it's what I take from that story is that, that people were afraid of like this machine and of looking stupid in front of it and of not knowing how to use it and were afraid of it on that level. And, and uh, you know, I, I think so much of this division between those who understand the machine in some sense and those who don't is, is, is a fear of not being able to understand it, a product of really bad educational systems where we're told that you must understand like this level of mathematics or this particular way of thinking about it to do that. And oh, I wasn't good at math, so this isn't for me. Um, you know, I'm not good at this thing, so this thing isn't for me. Um, like, yeah, that's, that's the bigger part of it is kind of removing this fear of understanding around it, which basically involves new ways of telling stories about it so that everyone has kind of access. Yeah. So that everyone has access to it. Um, uh, but there's also, then again, also a kind of further curiosity, which I find really fascinating that I don't really understand, which is just why some people are interested in thinking about this and some aren't, and I don't have the answer to that. Mm, uh, I just wanted to have a slight look into ourselves and the fact that our brain has a left and a right hemisphere and the relationship between that and also the fact that a lot of, obviously, the the left side of our brain is, is standing for the logic, which is also kind of replicating into the technology and, and, and you could, uh, yeah, creating the logic of the world that we're living in, in, in terms of computer. And so the question mark is literally, where do you see that our, you know, our right hemisphere kind of takes place in this world? Um, uh, I, I, don't, I don't know very much about the brain. Um, I, but all, all that sounds like to me is that we, we have both of them. Like we, we have the left and the right. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I mean, it's just like, you can access these questions through, through any set of tools you want. Um, it, and it's the same as, as the answer before, like you, we don't need a, you don't need to understand programming to think about computing. Like these are not separate things. You can understand it through poetry and through literature and through any other kind of means you want, if you, if you choose to engage with it. Um, and it definitely, like we need more thinking of that kind because, um, yeah, I guess there's, there's far too much, I don't know which way around it is, right brain, whichever the logical one is thinking in, in, in technology. Um, which which makes it a very very narrow discipline, which is yeah a problem. Um, I think my question is kind of similar to the one before in um, what you were saying about your Hayward Commission being about a kind of quest for metaphors, and how that essentially is kind of a quest for finding ways to make things relatable and digestible for people and to tell stories. And I was wondering if whether through writing the book you found some really amazing examples of people doing that that made you feel quite um, like we are going in the right direction or, or whether there's still something left to do there. Um, there's certainly quite a lot to do there. Um, where did I find it? You, you had, one? well, if Go I can, yeah, no, I can please. prompt you as your official yeah, prompter. Yeah, no, prompt me. I mean, you did have that nice story about um, nuclear fusion and sort of positive and negative oh, yeah, ways totally. yeah, that yeah, you yeah. can work with machines. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So this is a good one. This, um, <laughs> uh, this is a story about, uh, well, the, I mean, the real one's the chess one, right? I mean, the actually, it's, I tell a long we story about nu chess, nuclear fusion yeah. that's actually summed up by a short one about chess, um, which is, uh, so... 19, whatever it is, 96, 97, um, Kasparov, Deep Blue, the big chess match where Kasparov, the greatest human chess player pretty much of all time, uh, is beaten by this machine that IBM has built specifically and somewhat vindictively to beat him. Uh, <laughs> like, um, and uh, it's, it was held up as this moment of incredible, uh, like, this is it, this is it, humans are done, we're done. What actually happens is that it, Kasparov came back a year later with a new kind of chess that he called uh, centaur chess or advanced chess, which was humans and computers playing in teams together. Um, and um, it, it, it did something very weird to chess um, in that it, it opened up whole new fields of chess. And particularly it turned out that um, even though um, a uh, you know supercomputers have got 
wildly better than Deep Blue now at chess playing. Uh, a human armed or associated with or cooperating with, I like to think of it as, a kind of um, a computer of kind of medium power will beat the best chess computer in the world. There's something that happens when human and machine ways of thinking combine as different strategic approaches to the world that changes changes that does something to this form of thinking and makes a different kind of play possible that is not possible through computation alone. So that there is, we, we know, and I, I'm happy to say this is read that there's something different in human thought to computation. But what's super interesting to me is that actually the combination of the two um, is actually powerful than more powerful than either either of them separate. Uh, that's basically the one happy story in the book, uh, <laughs> which I then go on to explain why it doesn't stay happy either. But like, but as a central metaphor, um, the centaur, right, is is the one because it's it's the story of a kind of synergy between these kind of ways of thinking, and particularly a creative one, right, one that's actually exploring a territory. Like one of the, I hadn't thought of this before, but actually. Um, no, it's still a war. Anyway, uh, the, the, what happens is, is also that now we've been beaten at Go and the way in which we got beaten at Go is not amenable to this approach because it's been done with artificial intelligence that's, that's slightly terrifying. Um, and we don't know yet whether we're going to be able to collaborate with that kind of intelligence in the way that we could collaborate with IBM's computers. Um, but what I was thinking is also that Go is a game of like dominating the board in a kind of territorial way, whereas chess, is, chess feels more exploratory in some way. I don't know. Maybe that's not right, but there's something in that, and, and certainly in that combination that continues despite other stories to give me hope. Hiya. Um, Go ahead. Uh, in your book, you talk a lot about how um, we're learning, well, we're gathering more and more data all the time, but in fact, we're actually learning less and less about the world around us, and with the rise of big data, and just how do you think that we can start to repurpose pre-existing data, what we've already got, instead of adding to the constant virtual noise and out there? Yeah, I, well, I don't know about repurposing, um, although I'm sure there's plenty to be done there. I think my, my, my question is, like, at what point we're capable of acting on the information that we, that we actually have? Um, um, uh, and also operating in a world that actually doesn't rely on us trying to predict and control so much, essentially. Um, because you know the, there's bad outcomes from a lot of those prediction systems. Um, they become markets that get gamed and, and get played uh, in various ways um, that are not kind of everyone's to like, you know a democratic level of benefit. Um, um, I, like the example I give in the book, which is quite a specific one, is um, talking about the effect of this in in, in health data. So I, I talk a lot about. Um, Particularly, kind of recent, recent thought in in scientific discovery, where you know where things like drug discovery, the development of new drugs, has kind of uh, become entirely dominated by by big data. Um, but actually, it's producing fewer and fewer results uh, because the field of data is kind of so vast that people, in a not dissimilar way to the central chess approach, are starting to go back to scientific teams of small numbers of practitioners using something that might be described as instinct in cooperation with a technological system, right? That actually to hand the thing over, I mean, yeah, that, 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 that's the answer. Like the opposite to big data is not, or well, not the opposite, but the, the alternative is not no data. <laughs> it's, a, it's like a genuine and thoughtful engagement with the data that we have because data is not the only way of thinking the world. Um, and that, you know, anyone who, who, thinks otherwise is, is, is going to encode all of these kind of um, bad outcomes that we talked about before or is going to um, uh, just kind of get completely swamped and become completely impossible of decision making, you know, which is what I also think is happening at the kind of vast political level in, in media and the news where we are swamped with information but actually incapable of making any kind of rational decisions about it um, because we fail to see that we can actually make those ethical and moral decisions without necessarily arguing constantly over over every single final point of detail. Yes, we've got a question sort of towards the middle. Oh, yep, go ahead. Uh, what's the significance to you personally of having written a book? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, I like books. Uh, I've always liked books. Uh, I've, I've been writing on the internet for years. Um, uh, 
I think, and um, you know, it's available as an ebook as well. So I'll sidestep all the questions directly of of like the paper qualities of that because I've gone about it for ages. Um, the significance of a book is that it allows you to actually develop an argument in a much much longer form, and people might actually read it because no one reads a hundred thousand page web web page, hundred thousand word web page. Um, like you can you can. Yeah, I mean that's what that's what books are good for. They're good for developing an idea at proper length and spending spending a different amount of time with it. Um, I, I'm not so interested in questions around short attention spans or you know uh, technologies role in that thing. I, um, there's things you can do at shorter lengths, and there's things you can only do at a hundred thousand words or more, uh, and you can do really really interesting things at that length. Um, uh, so yeah. I, I I enjoyed doing it, and I think it's a good form of thought that um, that really is not under any particular threat, and we need we should keep doing. Yes, we have one right at the back there. Um, I wanted to ask you a bit more about metaphors because you talked about the value of understanding through metaphor and poetry, which I think I largely agree with, but at the same time it feels like a slight conflict with the fact that so many of our metaphors are really anthropomorphic in unhelpful ways. And I was wondering if you had any suggestions of how, how we can combat that, combat the idea of, we talk about computer vision, but it's not vision like we know it. We talk about machine learning, but it's a massively unhelpful word. Marvin Minsky called them suitcase words because they, the baggage they bring along with them. So yeah, how do you resolve that tension between metaphor but also trying to understand technology as if it were people rather than a thing that people make or are inside of. Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question and I'm not sure I, I got to an answer to. Um, um, because, like, think, well, so one of my answers is to not, like, think it in those terms, right? That's the darkness that I'm referring to as well, is that every time we try and metamorphosize one of these things, um, or metaphorize one of these things, rather, um, like we end up falling back on, onto the suitcase words, onto this baggage of our own understanding of the world. Um, and actually, the ability to kind of hold these things at arm's length as something radically other uh, is, is necessary and is actually a skill we need more widely, right? Like, I, I sort of say, like, with the five senses of the book, I think, in a way that I probably don't explain very well because I haven't really thought through it totally. But, like, um, we need to be able to think on, on these kind of radically non-human terms, right? So we need to be able to understand the agency of, of, of mountains, of rocks, of the climate itself, of things that ex go completely beyond human knowability, right? To think, to think of the, the, you know, this kind of deep otherness of the planet. Uh, in a in a predict in a in a productive way, in a way that actually like helps us survive it, um, um, and maybe so maybe the kind of the coming of AI I think of is almost a way of a way of teaching us to do that, um, because artificial intelligence is going to force us to think in such radically non-human ways um, uh, that we've so completely failed to do so far and that's why it's got us into so much trouble that we center ourselves in the world to such a degree that we've you know we've we've ended up despoiling it to some extent um like so yeah when i like i open the book with the with the question of like what what, what is what are computers trying to tell us um or what is the internet trying to tell us and one of the things i, I think it and and it by and even by asking that, I'm anthropomorphizing it massively, but I, you know, I like to go back and forth on it. Um, like one of the things it's trying to teach us is, is how to think about not ourselves, right? Uh, and like not, not our species and deeply outside of ourselves. Um, that we've spent, you know, however long we've been on this planet, consistently ignoring the needs of um, others at micro and macro scales, like, as, as, like other people, uh, as well as like other things and and the the planetary system itself uh, and it's it it's only as we actually build tools that start to like uh, act like those things or again start to act outside of us that we might actually have created like a way of thinking and talking about these things um you know that's come from ourselves and then we might finally take it seriously
I'd make a riposte to that though because I, I'm i dubious as to whether it's even possible to think the radical other in a way that's completely detached from ourselves. I think there perhaps is an argument to be made that says the reason that we anthropomorphise is it's simply impossible not to, that the very abstract concept of an apple requires you to have had some tangible experience of what it's like to hold an apple in your hand perhaps. And so I wonder if a better political manoeuvre isn't so much trying to think outside ourselves or recognise the agency of mountains in a way that's radically other to us, but rather to reconceive our own agency in ways that sort of enmeshes ourselves with the planet, enmeshes ourselves with technology. I I suppose the reason I asked you this rather tendentious question about um, the relationship between computation, computational thinking and racism and patriarchy is that there were parts of this book that really reminded me of the argument, uh, and you cite Walter Benjamin, and I was really reminded of, of um, the Frankfurt School and the, and Mark, specifically Max Horkheimer and Theodore Adorno's book, The Dialectic of Enlightenment, and this notion that the critical ethical and intellectual manoeuvre of the Enlightenment was to separate man from nature, render nature a sphere that we could control, and Therefore, eventually, they say, this will produce a situation where we put ourselves within the sort of subject of control. We, we, we have Nature is this inert uh, sphere beyond humans and eventually human beings become part of it where we therefore kind of control one another as though we're bits of inert matter. Um, and I think that there's a certain resonance between that argument and the kinds of uh, rather dark arguments you, you make in the book. Yeah, no, I mean, it was, it was Horkheimer and Adorno I don't think I said directly, but just told me it was okay to like challenge the Enlightenment, basically, because I didn't I didn't know you were allowed to do that. Um, that seemed like a really big thing to do, and yet here they were kind of doing that. And I was like, oh, okay, you can you can actually challenge that as a whole idea. So it gave me the 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 possibility of doing that. So it's exactly it. Um, but um, well, no, I mean you, you've you've said it essentially. Like I, I I also agree with you. I mean I I don't think the for, but for me the 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 radical otherness doesn't have to mean. Like it, it doesn't necessarily mean a distance. It's actually it can still be an acknowledgement, and actually it's it's what it basically means is that it means that it's that because what they're critiquing in that environment in, in the enlightenment way is like by by radically othering the world, you're you're making yourself superior to it, and I guess I guess my right. hope is that actually it's possible to regard others as equals, right? Uh, that's that's actually the kind of thing I've got, and that doesn't mean you you have to be kind of separate from them and, and distinct. And and to co-opt um, or to steal a ta- term from um, Horkheimer and Adorno, they have this lovely notion of enchantment and disenchantment. So they say the maneuver of separation from the world, so as to render it scientifically knowable, was a process of disenchanting ourselves from it. And perhaps this is where the question about poetry and literature and art Absolutely. comes in: is that there's a space for re-enchanting ourselves with the world, of recognizing our entanglement, of knowing that we we can't perfectly know some ahistorical truth but we can only kind of imperfectly grasp the products of our own history and that there's something that poetry and art can teach us there. Do we have any more questions? We probably have time for one or two. Um, Okay, I'll just make sure I haven't missed anyone. All right, we'll have two at the front here. Uh, Noah Yuval Harari speaks about our move from animism to humanism and then on to dataism. Would you like to take a stab on what's coming next? Uh, ooh, uh, uh, the total collapse of consensus reality. Uh, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, uh, I, Keep it I, 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 don't, I don't, <laughs> no, that's a good thing. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm for that future. I haven't, I haven't read that. Um, and, uh, I, I don't know exactly what he means by dataism. We, we definitely exist under something that maybe could be described as dataism now. I don't know if it, what he describes it as. Um, uh, uh, it's, yeah, I, I, I don't know what's coming next. Can I take a crack at it, even though I yeah, haven't written on, a book? Um, only because I was lucky enough um, a couple of weeks ago to see uh, Paul Preciado, um, who wrote Testo Junkie, um, give a presentation in London. And he has this argument where he's basically trying to extend uh, Foucault's idea of how power has worked historically, which is to say, pre-modernity, there was this idea of necropolitics. The role of the sovereign was to basically give out death, you know, do what I want or else we'll kill you. Then there was a shift in modernity to what Foucault calls biopolitics, which is the creation of institutions like the school, the hospital, the psychiatric office, which was about disciplining your body and mind to act in certain ways. And Paul says what we're moving to now, he's got this rather unusual phrase, I think he calls it pharmacopornographic, 
which is basically the, ro the, the role of um, biochemicals, hormones, as well as media that mean what were once uh, institutional mechanisms for governing our bodies and minds, the hospitals and the prisons and so forth, are now being internalised into our bodies biochemically and into our minds through media. And I think that there's something very interesting about that and, and certainly to me seems like quite an apt diagnosis of the sort of biopolitical regimes that we're moving through. Hi. Um, so on the topic of institutions, I'm a school teacher and I literally teach children uh, how to program in a really basic way, but I do it nonetheless. And what there's two schools of thought on this. I'm either conditioning children to become code monkeys in a dystopian future, or I like to believe that I'm teaching them to express themselves in the world around them because these things are inevitable. That's not a really good question, so I guess the question is, should I quit my job? <laughs> uh, no, and I shouldn't tell you. Um, uh, I, yeah, no, well, so in the book, I, I'm a bit mean about teaching code um, because I don't like it as a kind of catch-all response, uh, which in no way means it shouldn't be done. Um, I think it's incredibly important. And I, I'm also because I'm aware in so much of what I do that I'm arguing from this po position of quite possible privilege because you know, I did a, my background's actually in computer science and like, I studied this stuff and so I'm constantly telling people that they you know uh, that everyone should be able to understand this and they're like you're a computer scientist of course you understand it and like um the the question the, the thing that I think is interesting of, uh, of what you're clearly describing is um like how it changes your your thinking about the world like, yeah, we don't want to teach kids to... So the government model of teaching to code, why MPs keep talking about it, is, yeah, so that they'll be basically better at using computers to have jobs and earn money, rather than understanding that they have agency in the world and can change things themselves. Because learning to program basically, you know, in the simplest level, turns a computer from a, you know, a TV into a tool. Right? It stops being, a, you know, a passive engagement with a broadcast system and becomes, like, the most powerful tool humans have ever created. Uh, and that only happens if you can, learn, you can do a bit of coding. Um, uh, so no, uh, like absolutely, all the kids should learn to code, um, and but they should also do all of the other things as well. That's the thing. I think that's about the most positive we've got in the conversation so far. So so let's end there while we're on a high note. Um, so I just wanted to thank uh, both the Ace and Miranda for hosting us and to remind you all that books, signed books, um, will be able to be purchased for a, a steal at a mere ten pounds at the back of the room. So thank you all for coming. Thanks to all our volunteers um, for helping with tonight's event and also filming it. And if you like what you've seen, you can find out more about Virtual Futures online. So to end, I would say the future is always virtual. Some things that may seem imminent or inevitable never actually happen. Fortunately, our ability to survive the future is not contingent on our capacity for perfect prediction. Although sometimes and on those much more rare occasions, something remarkable comes uh, comes of staring the deep future in the eyes and challenging everything that it seems to promise. So I hope you all feel that you've done that today. So please join me in thanking the incredible James Bridal. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.